secular scientific, that's from CNN News. If you don't have the sun and you're lost, you're going to go in circles. You ever feel like your life has never changed? Let me tell you, if you're in your 20s, wait till you're in your 40s and you haven't changed. You're going to be more frustrated than ever that you're just going in circles. Because if the reference point physically to not walk in circles and walk straight to some progressive point forward is the S-U-N, even more true spiritually, the S-O-N will get you from walking in circles in relationships and life and meaning and purpose to where your destiny is. And your destiny is something greater than you could ever imagine. Because God says, I know the plans I have for you, not for calamity, not for calamity, but for a future, a welfare, which means prosperity, and a hope. That awesome? You need the sun so you don't walk in circles. You know, it's interesting. Most all humans I saw in this report, in this uh, book I read, never doubt that God has power, that God can do anything. What every human doubts, especially those that don't, don't know Him, they never question His ability. They only question His affections. How could, if God really, right? Why did He let this? It's not that He doesn't. We know He's got the power. I don't think He loves me. I don't think He loved me enough to stop what my daddy did to me when I was five years old. I don't think he loved me enough to stop that car accident that killed my... We never doubt his power. We only doubt his love. So the greatest thing there is, is love. There is nothing greater. There is. We are wired for love. In fact, do you know, there's studies that have been done, and, and the older people here, especially the married people that are older, they'll know this is true. Do you know that they have proven that babies have to be touched? Or it'll kill him. Do you know there's a, a there's a warehouse in Chicago? A pastor friend of mine, he and his wife became foster parents. I just talked to another guy recently, and I talked to this other guy about 15 years ago, this pastor friend, and his he was constantly taking in foster kids. He told me about a warehouse in Chicago that at that time would vary anywhere from three to six hundred homeless kids. It, and, and a lot of times babies, because mom was a crack addict and dad was in prison. And they'd confiscate, DCFS would capture these babies. And they literally had like a warehouse made for children. And there was a whole section that was quarantined off just for babies. And they would recruit people regularly just to come in and hold the babies. Because babies have to be held. Gary uh, Small, no, Gary Small or Gary Chapman? I think Gary Chapman wrote a book called The Blessing. He tells a true story about a young boy whose parents never touched him. Never gave him any attention any affirmation or any affection. And one day in grade school, he stepped off the bus on the way to school to get to get off the bus when it stopped and he dropped dead on the ground. When they did the autopsy, they were shocked. His blood had hardened in his arteries and they said that the only thing they could diagnose is that a lack of affection had killed him. You are wired for love. You need love. The, in fact, I've heard secular psychologists say the two greatest needs a human has is to be able to be loved and to be able to give love. And the greatest way to love is to receive the love who loves you the most. We love because he first loved us. First John 4, 9. This is my favorite saying. Actually, before I was a Christian, I went to college. I did not believe in any religion I wasn't an atheist, but I was more moving toward being an agnostic. There might be a God, but I don't know him. But I'd rather believe in God and be wrong than be an atheist and be really wrong. Because, I mean, the reason I believe in God and be wrong is I believe in God, but I wasn't his. And I knew I wasn't his. But I read this. It's by Emmett Fox. And I liked it so much, I actually put it on my wall, and I wasn't even saved yet. But it's called love. There is no difficulty that enough love will not conquer. There's no disease that enough love will not heal. By the way, if you don't get healed in this life, you're guaranteed to be healed in the next. There will be no disease in heaven. No door that enough love will not open. No gulf that enough love will not bridge. There's no wall that enough love will not throw down. There's no sin that enough love will not redeem. 
It makes no difference how deeply seated may be the trouble, how hopeless the outlook, how muddled the tangle, how great the mistake. A sufficient realization of love will dissolve it all. If only you could love enough. When I read this a year before I became a Christian in a secular bookstore in the University of Michigan, when I went up for the Michigan-Illinois game, which, by the way, when I left my room today, they were winning. It was amazing. It came from behind. It was the fourth quarter, and they were up 28 to 13. I was so happy. And I, I saw this, and I bought this poster. And when I read this last line that I'm going to give you, it, it just hit me so hard. I love good sayings of truth. If only you could love enough, you would be the happiest and most powerful being in the world. Well, let me tell you, the happiest and most powerful being in the world walked this planet. His name is Jesus. He is not only the most powerful. The Bible says in two places, Old Testament and New Testament, he was anointed with joy above every other human. I'll leave you with this true story. In fact, uh, I need to turn you guys on to it because believe it or not, a Czechoslovakian movie producer made a movie of this. And it just came out a little, not too long ago, about a year or so ago. This is a true story and it didn't happen too very far from here. And it's now world known. It happened back in the 1920s when the depression was going on. A man moved from the east uh, part of America to the Midwest to find work because there was no work to be found. And he found a job on the Mississippi River with a, a, a drawbridge. He was a drawbridge operator. And uh, it was not here near uh, Moline, Quad Cities. It was down farther, uh, not as far as St. Louis, but somewhere in, in, in um, central, south central, uh, south uh, Illinois, but not all southern Illinois, but it was on the Mississippi River. And he brought his family over, they moved him, and he had a couple children. And his little boy always wanted to go to work with him. And he never let his little boy go to work with him. And one day his little boy, I forgot when he was 8 or 10 years old, he said, Daddy, can I go to work with you? And finally one Saturday he said, yeah, you can come to work with me. This is a true story. By the way, this is a, I, I, when I first heard this, I, I, I did not know until years later, Dr. James D. Kennedy proved this is a whole true story. In fact, when you hear the story, you're given different names. But the guy's name was John and his son's name was Greg. John brought his son to work. And uh, he looked over the log for the trains that were coming that day and the, uh, the ships that were going under, to the, under the drawbridge. And um, the last uh, uh, ship went through and uh, he put the, he, the bridge was up uh, for more boats that were supposed to come. And uh, he told his son, his son was so excited to be there, watch the drawbridge go up and down. And his son... Uh, he said, Dad, can I go out and pray for a while? Because yeah, he said, there's nothing on the log books for quite a while. He said, I'm going to do some paperwork here in the office. The office was built right on the edge of the bridge, on the edge of the river. So he could oversee and had glass all around it. And his son went outside and started playing. And the guy got engrossed in all of his work. And all of a sudden, he heard the distant sound of a train whistle. And he, he looked down. He, he didn't realize how much time had gone by. He looked at the logbook, and it was the Memphis Express train. And he realized he had to get the drawbridge down, because it was up. And so he started to, to, to grab the lever, and he had this thought at that moment. Where's Greg? 